Uh, this is the uh, lecture on contracts. It's the third class. Uh, first class we went over the um, basically an introduction and, and you know talked about the class and what we expected. Uh, and then in the second class we talked about legal reasoning and, and ethics uh, primarily. I think we just spent a lot of time on ethics, but anyway. And we'll be doing more on ethics later. Uh, this class, we're going to be talking about the nature of contracts. And so this is a general overview of the subject. Uh, we will have a test on contract on February 17th, so listen up. <laughs> okay. Before we have that test, we'll probably have some quizzes. I'm not, I haven't exactly set the date for the quizzes, but you usually will be given a couple of days to do them. And the same with the, uh, the test you'll be given. So you need at least two days to kind of look at them and and do them. You'll be able to use your notes. And so, uh, so what is the nature of contracts? What, what do we deal with when we talk about contracts? Well, uh, I guess the first thing to realize is that there's a reason we keep promises. And so I, I've, I've got three reasons listed here. There are probably more. Uh, I think a very common reason is because it's the ethical thing to do. Some people say, well, yeah, I made that promise. I should keep my word. I'm a good character. I'm, I'm virtuous, right? <laughs> so if you're a virtue ethics person, you would say, I keep my word. <laughs> you know, if, if I say something, I, I stand by it. Okay? That's, that's a good reason to do it. Uh, if you're a utilitarian, you might say, uh, you want to maintain a reputation for reliability. That's, that's the second reason you know, uh, that you would do it. And so that fits in with utilitarian ethics. And uh, the third reason is there are legal consequences to not keeping contractual promises, at least. But also sometimes keeping promises that are not necessarily contractual. So for instance, partnership. A partnership contract is not necessarily contractual. Oftentimes not. And uh, it may actually involve contracts. Uh, even the statute of frauds may be involved. It may be required to be in writing. On the other hand, a partnership is not required to be in writing. You don't, you're not required actually to have a contractual promise uh, in that. But there are legal consequences to, to not falling through on your partnership agreement. Okay, so definitions of contract. Uh, I've got three. <laughs> seems like everything I do is in threes. Uh, I've got three definitions here which I'd like you to consider. There are lots more definitions. You, you, you know, we, I, I could probably have a long list of definitions. I could, I could spend a whole class talking about definitions of contract. But I think these are three that are very pertinent and are, are very informative. Uh, the first one is a promise or promises for which the law gives a remedy or the performance of which the law recognizes as a duty. So that's an interesting kind of thing. Brings in the idea of it being a duty, which actually is in, implying that the law has something to do with virtue, right? Duty is, is a virtuous concept. Uh, and uh, it also talks about there being a, a remedy. So then it talks about those consequences we talked about. Okay, so that's, that's a well-known definition. It comes out of a case, a famous case, as all these definitions do. Uh, another uh, definition is, is that it's a bargain for exchange of legal benefits or legal detriments. And we'll talk about that when we talk about consideration. So consideration is one of the uh, important elements of contract. You can't have a con contract. Uh, you could have a quasi-contract maybe, but not a contract without consideration. There has to be consideration uh, for a contract to exist. So it's a bargain for. Well, what's that mean? That means that there is a negotiation between the parties. Usually uh, they're going to negotiate the price maybe of something that's being sold or the value of, of a certain service being received. They're going to be negotiating and, and uh, the idea is that each side is going to get something that they think is worth it and give up something that they are willing to sacrifice to get that thing that they really think is worth it. So in some cases, say you buy a car, you uh, give to the car dealership usually a certain down payment. That may be a car that you bring in exchange, and, and that becomes your down payment. So it can be exchange of goods. But also, you would usually maybe pay a certain sum, oftentimes over a period of time. You know, so you, you're basically taking out a loan maybe from somebody and paying them back over time. You promise to pay 
car back over time. That, that, that loan may be actually from the car dealership, but more often it's from a finance organization that's connected to the car dealership, or it might be your own bank. So a lot of people, when they go to buy a car, will actually go ready to buy a car. They, they've already looked at prices and they know they, they expect to pay a certain amount for the car. And so they've got a loan that would cover that amount, maybe a little more. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when they're there, they're, they're ready to deal. Uh, a lot of people do that, when, not only with buying a car, but also in buying a home. You know, and buying a home, that becomes rather important because, you know, uh, oftentimes if it's a really good deal, you want to snap it up quickly. So I lost the home. I was the second party to look at the home. I saw the parties coming out. I knew that and when I called up the day, that they told me that it hadn't been looked at, and the earliest I could look at it was late in the afternoon. But it was uh, as as we were going in, this party was coming out, and you know w they had a different uh, salesperson, we had a different salesperson, so they got in ahead of us, and they bought it before we we could. So we we actually we didn't know they had bought it, so we went ahead and made a bid, but we were turned down on it. So you know we were able to do that because we already had the loan lined up. So. A lot of times that's a good idea to line up your finances before times. If you don't want to do that, sometimes you know the you might think that you might get better terms from the dealerships. You know, zero percent interest. Uh, you see these advertisements. I've always thought that that just simply meant that you're paying a higher amount of money up front. But uh, I don't know. So I never was really never really thought about doing that too much. I've never really checked into it to see whether it was really worth it and whether they were. You know, and it's, it's difficult for me to judge anyway, but I got to figure out first what the price of the car is. And then, you know, if they're going to, you know, and I'll bargain for a lower price, that's when you go into the dealership. Nowadays, actually, because of COVID 19, people are not going into the dealerships and negotiating. It's being done all online, which would be, I think, and I guess you could still bargain for it, but it puts you in a little different position. You haven't seen the car. Looking at the car, you can point out, if it's a used car, you can point out defects it has. Or, you know, you've, you can say, well, yeah, I, I drove the car and it seems okay, but I thought it was a little bit, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly too, I wasn't exactly comfortable with it, you know, or something. And you kind of like try to get them to come down a little. Uh, there are various other strategies that you would use. Anyway, so a bargain for exchange of legal benefits or legal detriments. So just as consideration is important, the bargaining is important. That is often shown by the offer and the acceptance. There are usually lots of offers, but there's only one acceptance, and that closes the deal. Once there's an acceptance, then you've got a contract, everything else being there, if you have the consideration and you have the uh, competent parties and you have no uh, circumstance that would indicate that the deal wasn't, wasn't possible, such as maybe somebody not being of age, uh, and, and in which case you could actually do it if you have a cosigner. Uh, so, uh, bargain for exchange, very important, just as consideration is important. A voluntary agreement establishing mutual obligations enforceable by a court. That's the third definition we offer. So, here, here you have the legal uh, aspect of the court being there, being ready to uh, enforce the obligations, and there will be obviously legal consequences. So, there, there you have your ethical duty. Uh, that you know the ethics of duties is important. We'll look at the ethics of duty. We'll look at the ethics of virtue. We'll look at the ethics of uh, utilitarianism. So, contractual promises. Okay, contractual promises invoke an obligation of future performance. Uh, now there are two kinds of promises. One is a bilateral promise contract and a bilateral promise. A bilateral promise proposes a, an exchange of a promise for a promise. And so I, I like to use as an example the buying of a house. When you buy a house, you don't immediately usually get the house right away. And they don't usually get the money right away. Instead, uh, you, you, you come prepared with a certified check. They have to cash the check. And actually, um, you know, that check may have come from a bank where you've taken out a loan. So um, you're promising to uh, buy the, the house. You're promising them that this loan <coughs> from the bank is good, that their check is good, and it usually is. 
and uh, they're promising to deliver to you in the future a uh, certified check. So usually when you negotiate the contract, you set a date for the closing, and at the closing, that's when you show up with that certified check. So basically, you make the contract, uh, usually all the times with a salesperson who's representing the, the seller, and you make the contract uh, with that salesperson, and uh, you sign a document that says that you will show up at a certain date, usually a month or two after the, after the contract is signed, and uh, it could be any, any amount of time, uh, and that you will, at that time, have a uh, certified check. During the interim, you know, there are things that you will do that have to be met for the contract to be good, which is you'll have a right to inspect the house, and the house has to be in good condition, and you can insist that they make it in good condition before you close on the deal. And, uh, you know, or you could waive that requirement if you wanted to. But you would usually want, want them to make good on it or give you certain concessions. If you're going to waive it, you might want to have them give you the money and you'll pay for it, the uh, fixing of it, <laughs> if you want to do that. And so uh, that's a bilateral promise. You're promising in the future to show up with a check. They're promising at, at that closing to show up with the title to the house and maybe the key. And uh, you, you want the key so you can start moving your stuff in. But oftentimes there may be some difficulty and the party may still have stuff in the house so he has to clear it out. So uh, he won't give you the key maybe until you do that. But you can insist upon getting the key under the contract so long as the contract doesn't say that he can, doesn't have to deliver the house by that, at that date. Uh, it's usually implied that that's going to be a date where you get the key. So you can start bringing your stuff in. So he should clean it out. A lot of people when they're buying a house want to have a house that's clean and it has got a lot of clutter in it so that they're relatively certain that everything's going to go as planned and they can maybe get out of that apartment that they've been living in and uh, not have to pay extra rent. The unilateral contracts, an exchange in which one party performs and the other party promises a future performance. So this is, I like to use it as an example, a very simple kind of a deal where, you know, you say to the kid down the street, uh, well, would you cut my grass on Saturday? And if you show up on Saturday and cut my grass, I will pay you a certain amount of money. Now that sounds like a contract there, but that's not really a contract. That's just an invitation. You're inviting him to come down and cut your grass for which you will pay him. And you'll pay him before he starts cutting the grass. So you, or actually he'll cut the grass before he's paid. <coughs> oh, although you could do it the other way, but most people would say you've got to cut the grass satisfactorily and then I'll pay you. And so um, that's a unilateral contract where he has to do his performance. And you, you know, those unilateral contractors, uh, contracts, they usually do that. So uh, say returning a dog or for which there's a reward. There's usually, uh, it's usually a unilateral contract. You've got to return the dog, the right dog, huh, before you have any right to claim payment. But you return the dog and then, and then they have to pay you. And so it's a unilateral contract. So unilateral contracts are like that. Uh, one thing is uh, the unilateral contract, you have to give them, you can't hinder their performance of it. So you can't stop them from finishing performance and say, well, you didn't finish, so I don't have to pay you. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Anyway, so the, the, we break out of these contracts into bilateral contracts and unilateral contracts. What's, what's the buy about? What's the two sides of it? Well, two sides of it is that the contract uh, on both sides isn't fulfilled yet. On a unilateral contract, one side has performed before, he has, before there's actually a contract formed. Functions of a contract. Uh, uh, first function, I think, that we want to mention is that it gives assurance to both sides that promises will be kept, thereby eliminating risks. So businesses. Uh, have a, a need to have contractual promises to make sure they're getting the supplies and the equipment and the uh, parts that they need ahead of time. If you're a restaurant, you need to make sure that you're getting enough of the foods that you're going to be selling. That you have enough eggs, you have enough of the meat that you're selling. The things that you need for your, for your menu are there and uh, that everything you need to run your business is there ahead of time, so you usually enter into contracts for those things if you don't already have them. And sometimes you might buy a, 
a business, say a restaurant that already has everything that you need, but even then usually there's certain things you wouldn't have, there's certain things that they could run out of. Entities, the non-breaching party, uh, another function of a contract, uh, entitles the non-breaching party to collect remedies from the breaching party or, or legal relief. So that's part, that's why you have the assurance that the other side will perform. He knows he's going to have to pay if he doesn't. And unfortunately, there's sometimes you run into situations where a party is broke, and so you can't get blood out of a turnip. And so one of the things you might want to consider in entering into a contract is whether or not the other party is likely to be able to fulfill the terms. If he's got to make payments, can he afford to make the payments? Uh, if, if, if he's going to perform some actions, is he qualified to do it? So you, you have to hire a lawyer who's licensed to practice law. You want to go to a dentist who knows how to do dentistry and is licensed to do so. You know, you don't want to go to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing is going to maybe make a botch of the job and you're not going to be satisfied. So it's very important for you to make sure that the uh, party can perform. So entitles you. Yes, you could you could sue those parties maybe for some relief, but uh, uh, you really don't want relief. You want to get what you want in terms of services that, or you know or cash if you if you're lending them money. You want you want to make sure that they give you the money. And they, now uh, one thing that's very important to understand is the objective theory of contracts. A party's intent is determined by the party's observable acts and facts rather than unseen intentions such as the parties uh, such as what the party said at the time so um, so that's an observable fact what did the party say if you if you got it on paper that's very valuable right uh, so my advice is get all your your contracts that are important to you make sure that they are if, if it's not an important contract why are you making it but uh, if, if it's an important contract to you, I make sure that you have it in writing. There's an old saying, a verbal contract isn't worth the paper it's written on, which is an oxymoron, uh, because it's not, there's no paper that's written on. So it's basically telling you that it's worthless. Uh, it's not truly worthless. Sometimes a, you can enforce an oral contract. Oftentimes uh, you can maybe introduce evidence to it. But then again, there are certain cases, certain kinds of contracts that are required to be in writing. But on the other hand, that means that there are certain other contracts that are not required to be in writing. So for instance, certain agreements don't have to be in writing. I already mentioned one of them, partnership. However, if you enter into a partnership and thereby acquire an interest in, say, the lease of a building by being a partner in, in that business, or you enter into a partnership where they deal in real estate and you acquire an interest in the lands that the firm owns, uh, that would have to be in writing, and that's called the equal dignities rule. We'll talk about that again later on. Uh, uh, you know, what the party said at the time is therefore important, so, you know, uh, it would be good to have a way of accurately reporting that. A witness is helpful. You know, I, I, I guess there are some circumstances where you might be able to introduce a tape, but you need to be careful to document uh, that the tape is a good tape. And there are problems with getting that evidence introduced sometimes. How the parties behaved at the time is also something. And so sometimes you can, you can show evidence of, of the parties' behaviors. Um, and they, they can be, uh, and just not only that, uh, but also all the circumstances which existed and presumably impacted upon the contract at the time of contracting. So for instance, one kind of contract arose in which a party was calling up and ordering Christmas trees for his club, and his, his Elks Club or his Bull Moose Club or whatever it was, sold Christmas trees every Christmas. And they always dealt with the same uh, company and the same tree company, the uh, same nursery. And uh, the nursery would, uh, they, they would tell the nursery how much they wanted, and then the nursery would send it and, and charge them its standard price. Oftentimes they didn't even talk about price. Uh, they just trusted one another. And the details were oftentimes a little murky. So one could attack that and say, well, they really didn't have a contract because it's not clear exactly what was intended. You could say that. But if they've been done this in the past and there's a record of how they did it in such a way that you can actually prove what the terms of the contract are. In other words, if, uh, for instance, very consistently when you made the order, 
they delivered it as of a week, within a week of, of your order. And, and, and they always charge you a going rate based upon some published uh, information by some company that keeps track of what Christmas trees are selling. I don't know if there is such a, a data, but in some kinds of contracts you will have the ability to say what is the going rate. And, uh, you know, so you have an index of what the prices are, maybe published somewhere. Maybe in the Wall Street Journal, you have that for like iron, and you have that like for coal, and you have that for hog bellies. And, you know, you, you get that there. Even though you didn't mention it, but this is what you've been doing every year. And, uh, and therefore, you could argue, well, there was a contract. Both parties understood that they were going to do the deal just the same way as they did in the year past. And they may even have said that. Uh, but even if they didn't say that, it's possible for a court to say, I think I can see that there is the terms of the contract. His main concern is being able to fashion a remedy as a judge for these parties to make a fair remedy. And this sounds like that could be something that would be a fair remedy to say, well, this is how you dealt with it in the past, and we presume that you both intended to do the same this time. And so he could find the existence of a contract. Or he could say, I don't think there's enough here, or I don't think this is reliable enough information to give me uh, to show that there was actually a contract formed because you didn't supply enough terms of the contract. So that's also another reason why you might want to have this in writing. However, oftentimes people do do business over the phone and each side may write down on their side and they might be able to produce that as a writing. But, uh, you know, it's useful to have the other side sign that document or, you know, send you a copy of what he's got anyway. And it's maybe sign that and maybe a, sort of an email signature. Uh, how the parties behaved at the time and all the circumstances which existed at the time, therefore, are important in determining certain oral contracts, how they exist. So you can see there are problems with oral contracts. And oftentimes, there can be disputes over that. But there are ways of getting around these, and sometimes they can be enforced. Uh, and uh, some of it depends upon the judge uh, being able to do that. But also, the law supports it. The Uniform Commercial Code actually supports that. We're not going to deal with the Uniform Commercial Code, but there's a section of it that says that uh, the uh, court can uh, use things like indexes where the price has not been established. Price is a very important kind of thing, uh, and the parties can use things that are rather vague. And so you'd be surprised what can be done. Okay, so the objective period theory of contract, you look at what the party said, that would be the biggest thing to do, to have something that he said. And hopefully that would, if it was in writing, tops. And sometimes absolutely required. If you're going to uh, prove the existence of the contract, you need to have that. Now, I, I want to say this, that actually we will see that actually when we talk about statute of frauds, it is possible to prove the existence of a contract that was required to be in writing under, circum under certain exceptions. So there are exceptions to it, one of which is admissions. If you can get the guy to stand and ask him if he had an agreement with you, the judge may well find that agreement was a contract. But you usually can't because the other side's lawyer will, will uh, foreclose that by moving to dismiss the case when it's first called. And that's what he should do. And, uh, you know, so it would be malpractice if he didn't. <laughs> so most lawyers know to do that and uh, we're, we're in the appropriate case. So, uh, so we'll talk about statute of frauds again later. Elements of contract. So there are four elements we're going to talk about. One, the first one is agreement. Some people will split that up into offer and acceptance. So that's what an agreement consists of. One party makes an offer, so that's a proposal. The other side accepts the proposal in its terms with no significant modifications. Uh, there might be, he might ask for certain compromises, in which case the other party may or may not be required to approve of the compromises. On the other hand, it depends on how he says he said, he said, I wish you would accommodate me this way, but if you don't, I, I, you know, that's okay. Then you, he, he can do that. But if he makes the acceptance dependent upon your accepting new terms or different terms, that's not a contract. So the agreement's a very important kind of thing. And this is one of the process elements. And I separate out these four elements into two parts. One of the process elements, which is agreement and consideration. We already talked about consideration in a sense. And consideration is something for something. Uh, and it also, uh, by the fact that you negotiated this consideration, shows that there was an intent to be bound and the importance of enforcing the, the, the promise. So 
uh, consideration is absolutely required if you're going to have a contract. Now, there are certain situations in which you might not have consideration as such, or you might not have the promise. But that might be enforceable under equitable issues, so we'll talk about those later. Uh, competent parties. Uh, so competent parties means you have to be of age, you can't be crazy, you can't be, uh, um, you know, drunk. You have to know what you're doing at the time that you uh, are entering into the contract. You, you, you can't be senile, <laughs> okay? And so uh, th those are the three categories. A, a minor, a minor uh, sometimes can go to court and have himself declared um, independent and uh, basically be able to enter into contracts. But other than that, you're going to maybe need to have an adult sign with them. Uh, legal purpose and means. Okay, so uh, obviously, if you have a contract that contemplates a illegal purpose, such as uh, delivery of cocaine, which is an illegal substance, and you can't have that kind of contract. If you have that kind of contract, it's not a contract. It's not enforceable at law. And uh, all the cops will do when they catch you is they'll confiscate the cocaine and the and the money. And sometimes the cars that are being used, uh, they've done that certainly in the past. So you, know, you don't want to get involved in that kind of business. And because you can't go to court and enforce that contract, the people you buy the drugs from, if you didn't pay for it, or you gave them a bad check or some other, for some reason you shorted them on, on the exchange, they don't sue you in court. They send out what they call an enforcer and he throws you out of a car going 60 miles per hour or out, hangs you by your ankles out of a window and possibly drops you or just threatens you at this point. Or he maybe beats you up with a baseball bat. <laughs> so he's not a very pleasant means of collecting that. So uh, he can't use the illegal means, so he'll use illegal means. So don't get involved with those kind of contracts. And if you do, uh, be sure you uh, don't wind up in debt that uh, you can't pay. So uh, the, the competent party and legal purpose, I call those other elements, the process elements. Basically, most cases are going to swing on the process elements. And, all, and, and you know, when you're given like a, a case uh, to decide whether it's a contract, when you have to decide whether it's a contract, what you're looking for is, if, is are the process elements there? And what you're, uh, what, uh, if you got them, then if nothing else is said, you've got a contract. Now, the trouble is that something else might be said. So if in, in, the, in the facts there is something about somebody being incompetent or, uh, or it's not a legal purpose or means that's, uh, the means being used is not, maybe not legal, if that's the case, then it's not a contract. So those other elements come in only if they do. So they don't have to actually be, hit, be in the facts for you to answer the question of there being a contract. They only did take the thing from not being a contract. So I don't know why uh, they're treated the same sometimes by people. You know, people are looking for it and you don't need to. The answer is you have a contract if the process elements are made and there's not any of the other elements that have not been Things. But there are other things that are not uh, listed as elements that actually can disqualify a contract, which is interesting. But that's just the way the courts have interpreted these things and came up with these elements. So enforceability. A court will order enforcement of a promise only if the party seeking the order shows proof of the party's intent to enter the contract. Best proof is, of course, the guy signed the contract. Okay. Now that may not be sufficient Okay. if it was obtained by fraud, duress, or undue influence, it won't be sufficient. Or if the guy's underage, it's not going to be su sufficient, or he's otherwise incompetent. But uh, you need to have proof of the of the party's intent to enter the contract. So how do you determine that? You use the objective theory of contracts. What did it seem like he was doing? Did it seem like he wanted to enter into the contract? And if his, if an oral contract, that's just simply proof that he said yes to the deal, or he accepted something. You know, if you go in and you, you drive off with a car from the dealership, they can prove that you took the car, and therefore they can prove that you intended to have a contract because they don't sell it for nothing. And so, <laughs> but they, they usually have you sign a contract, and they should. And so that would be a problem for them if they didn't. But uh, they could maybe still prove that case. Uh, you can't get the car and, and, and drive off and not pay. Or, you know, leave them with a, a loan document, a, a uh, promissory note. Um, proof of the terms of, of the contract 
is required so that the court can fashion a remedy. So you, you talked about that before. The court needs to be able to look at the contract, whether it was oral or written. It has to know what the terms of the contract were. So you need to have all the pertinent terms that you would expect to see in the contract spelled out. Some terms might be both left open where there's some reason to believe that the parties intended to use something like an index. So we talked about that before. Uh, and if there's some other way of doing it, you can indicate in there that the index will determine the price. If you have it in writing, that's what you do. But it, like I said, we're in an applied contract. Sometimes things can be implied from past dealings. And so we'll talk about that later on when we talk about writings and uh, determination of contract. In certain specified cases, a writing sign by the party denying the contract is required. So there are six kinds of cases traditionally required to be in writing by the contract law. Now there are other contracts that are required to be in writing by some other law, but we're going to deal with six under the statute of frauds. Uh, and so we'll, we'll cover those when we get there. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you an example now of a contract. And so, um, you know, you decide whether how this should come out, what, what you think is right or wrong. You don't necessarily have to come to a legal conclusion because I'm not going to give you the uh, contractual documents to look over which you would need if you actually wanted to say what was legally required, but what, what do you think in terms of the ethics. Gary and Peggy were paid on their fire insurance claim for a loss of a building and its content, however. The amount paid was less than the approved value. Uh, the insurance company also refused to pay and obtain an office which was a continuing expense, business expense covered by the policy. The insurance company did pay 80% of their claim. The couple had to say sue to collect the difference. Are they entitled legally to that amount? Well, I, I think they are, right? Because if indeed, uh, unless the, the contract contains a clause saying otherwise, uh, they're entitled to the full amount. You know, so the clause might say they're only entitled to 80% on the value of the property. Um, but, you know, it, it's not likely, uh, you know, it sounds to me like they didn't pay the, the rental, uh, which was included in the contract. Well, I think that they are, have a right to have that rental pay, you know. The insurance company knows what it's doing, and, and you know if they wanted a contract that didn't provide for the rental, they could have maybe gotten a cheaper price. So let's take a look. So that's a bilateral contract. So we already talked about, uh, okay, now let's talk about good faith. The law presumes that the parties have contracted in good faith and will perform their obligations in good faith. For example, a unilateral contract will not be terminated once performing side starts to the act. So if you hire that kid down the street to cut the grass, you can't say, after he cuts the front yard, you can't say, well, go home now. I don't want to, I don't want to pay you. You got to pay him for his job. And the only thing you could do is argue that he hasn't done it right. And if he's cut down your flowers, you know, you might uh, reduce how much you pay him a little bit for, for that reason. But you cannot actually refuse to pay him anything because he's done some work that you ordered. And you should have maybe been more careful to hire somebody who would do it right. But, you know, sometimes that happens and you can't actually reduce the price if they don't do it to a satisfactory level. And so that's, whether it's satisfactory or not, is a fact that has to be determined in a court of law. But, uh, you know, between the parties, they can usually work this out between them. And they know if they didn't do a good job, usually. Unilateral contracts will not be terminated once the performance side site starts to act. We said that. Renewal of contracts will not be made impossible to accomplish. So if you're a restaurant, you establish uh, your a business and good, goodwill towards your business and customers to come in, you have a client, client base. Uh, that is a valuable asset. You can actually list that as an asset on your on your uh, balance sheet. And if you sold the restaurant, the fact that you are going concerned and have an established client base uh, would actually bring you a higher price. 
Okay, the uh, courts in England were divided into law courts and equity courts, and equity courts did things differently than law courts did. Now, therefore, but we still have the concept of equity, but we don't have two separate courts. The legal courts, the law courts now, will, however, consider in certain cases equity. And so one of the areas that that pops up is something called quasi-contracts. Uh, these are, uh, are equitable cases, uh, and, you know, the equity is imposed, uh, so the idea on equity is doing what's fair, imposed despite a lack of intent or a lack of a promise. You can't prove that there was a promise made, maybe. I think it's very frequent to have that. And to prevent unjust enrichment and to give what's called quantum merit, to give the person that which they deserve, quantum merit, to the extent that they deserve something, they should be paid. So a very easy example is a doctor finds a, a little boy in a ditch, shivering and cold and sick, and he takes the, the boy to his clinic and his, his, at his clinic they nurse him back to health. Uh, or maybe, maybe a veterinarian finds a bull limping down the street with an injured uh, paw. In both cases, he, they, they take them, you know, the, the veterinarian takes him to his clinic and he fixes up the bull. Well, uh, the, the father of the boy finds out where he is, comes down, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, the doctor says, well, uh, yeah, we took care of him, and here's the bill, <laughs> okay? And the father collects the boy. Now, the, the, unlike the bull, the, uh, you know, the uh, vet could just keep the bull if the, doc, if, if the farmer doesn't pay and say, well, you need to pay me for the bull. And so that might be a problem for the farmer, and he probably wouldn't want to pay. Uh, however, with the with the boy, uh, you can't keep the boy. That would be kidnapping, okay? If you're the doctor, but you can you can bill him for it. And uh, although he, he never promised to pay you anything, right? So there's no contract. So you see how that applies. And a court will oftentimes, in that case, give you a right to collect uh, money on that contract. Um, interestingly enough. The very first uh, restatement of contract had that very case, and they said, well, they couldn't collect because it was a promise, and, you know, it just, uh, there was no, no promise. Uh, but the second restatement of contract, the more modern one, says, yes, they can collect for that kind of thing. And, you know, they use the bull as an example. And, you know, the farmer is going to pay pretty much probably before he gets his bull back, I'm, I'm sure, in that case. Um, but, you know, uh, so. In either case, it's to prevent unjust enrichment. They had received a service. Now, uh, there are certain things that might come up in regard to that. Um, in quasi-contract, it is not available if the service or goods provided were either unnecessary, so, you know, didn't need to be, nothing needed to be done, um, you know, or if there was, it, it arose out of negligence or misconduct by the party seeking payment, you know. So if the Let's say the doctor, due to his negligent driving, hit the boy and then took him to the clinic and he treated him back for health and he tried to charge the, the, uh, the, the parent. The parent might well say, well, I'm, I'm not going to pay for that. You, 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 you injured him, therefore, you know, you, you should give us those services free. And maybe, maybe I want to sue you for negligence, actually. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll get a lot more than just simply the, your fees. Uh, also, maybe get some sort of uh, damages or uh, pain and suffering of the boy, my pain and suffering, because I'm now worried about him, you know, and uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that would arise in that case, because if it's negligence or misconduct, he wouldn't have to pay anything. In fact, may want to bring a suit to, uh, for, of his own just to collect from the doctor for his negligence. Okay. And so, the, so, Quasi contract is not available if it was an unnecessary service that was provided, or if it arose out of negligence or misconduct by the party seeking payment. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is actually unconscionable contracts. Maybe one of the most famous cases of an unconscionable contract would be the Merchant of Venice. We'll talk about that later in a minute, but we'll give you some other examples. This is a contract which is so unfair as to shock the conscience in which a court will refuse to enforce in whole or in part. And so there is procedural unconscionability. A, this is a contract in which one of the parties had oppressively greater bargaining power, experience, and, and critical knowledge than the other party. 
so you know this relates to the procedures under which the contract was made. How, how did the parties proceed? George was injured while riding in a cab by the negligence of the driver. The cab company sends a lawyer who persuades George to sign a release. Uh, the insurance companies will always send out somebody, but they'll never send out a lawyer to do this because the lawyer would be seen as a person who would maybe uh, be able to manipulate uh, and intimidate the, uh, the claimant. Um, and so they wouldn't do that. And so, but they will send out a, a skilled party who knows how to talk to people and oftentimes is very good at it, maybe better than any lawyer would be, actually. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know any cases where you can beat those if they're just ordinary persons without some sort of legal qualifications. Um, they're just very, maybe very persuasive kind of people, uh, very friendly people, and they make you feel good and give you all the arguments. And they may actually persuade you. And uh, I, I don't know, that may be even not ethical, but that's the way they do it. Um, choice of law. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about next is choice of law. And you find this uh, off actual times nowadays, especially on the internet. Uh, so the laws of different countries and the laws of different states even are different, right? They vary on the way contracts are interpre interpreted and enforced. So the law in Indiana may be different than the law in New York or, or California. Yet on the internet, you might be dealing with a party from a distance like that. And therefore, uh, rather than leave the issue of which state's law to apply to a judge, the merchants often write into their contracts form selection clauses and say which which state laws apply. And you know, they're usually going to put in the law of their state or one uh, another state that they think favors them for some reason. And so that, that would be very important. Now that's negotiable as any, any other term of contract is, but uh, generally they're not coming to on the internet to negotiate that, I think. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, it, it would be negotiable. Online contracts and choice of all merchant sellers on the internet usually specify the state in which they operate as the state whose terms will govern because they're familiar with it, uh, the contract and its terms. But they're not; they could choose your state, or they could choose any other state they want. Um, generally, but you you have to agree to it. You have to sign off on that. You have to well, click off on it, right? Uh, generally, such clauses are enforceable. However, courts in several states have refused to enforce them as oppression or as contrary to public policy. I don't think any recent courts have done that, to my knowledge. Uh, I think they're pretty much enforceable. Uh, and the only issue might be whether there was some undue influence, whether there was some, some unfairness. So we might get into procedural unconscionability again, where somebody was uh, executing something terribly unfair. Can they be fair to the buyers? So yes, they can be fair to the buyers if the buyer knows what they are, and as long as the terms of the contract are not too extreme. And talking about extreme, there's no better case to, uh, to uh, show that than in, in The Merchant of Venice. The banker insisted on enforcement of the exact terms of the contract. The difficulty was the contract called for the defaulting debtor, um, who the merchant, to pay the banker to pay for the default with a pound of flesh. Not only was it a pound of flesh, but it was from any part of the body that the banker would choose. And this particular banker chose the uh, uh, pound of flesh nearest the heart and uh, was actually regretting that he had done that because it turned out that that was seen by the court, the Venice court, as too extreme and unfair. And they don't, they don't talk about unconscionability in there. They just, no, well, actually, actually, actually what it was is uh, the lawyer for the other side said, okay, go ahead and take, take your pound of flesh, but if he dies, then you're going, you realize you're going to be committing a murder, and that's all you're entitled to. You specified what you want, and, that's, and so he didn't get that, and he was completely denied anything on that. So it's an interesting case. Some people feel that it's unfair to Jewish people because the banker was a Jewish person, and the court ordered him um, to actually become a Christian, <laughs> believe it or not, and uh, other things happened in it which were very unfair to Jewish people at the time. But, uh, you know, if we're, if we're looking at, I can't imagine any, any, any kind of contract that would require you to give up a pound of flesh. But you can imagine there are certainly today a lot of people who sign loans and there have been people who've been 
uh, very badly treated. So, for instance, a lot of these loans that were responsible for the, the crash um, of the housing market uh, actually were, were actually that way. Uh, you know, people were being sold these loans and these were people who were largely ignorant and taken in loans where the interest just piled up to a great extent. But I know no cases where a court actually intervened with it. Why? Because it seems that it's not a case of procedural unconscionability if you sign the contract and they tell you what the terms are ahead of time. Even though uh, you maybe are a person of very little education and are, are confronted with people who are telling you, oh, don't worry, it's okay, you know, this will, this will be all right, you'll be able to do this. Um, and so I don't know of any cases uh, where bankers got into trouble for that, but maybe they should have. How far would an American court go in enforcing agreements? Uh, would an American court enforce such a contract term? I don't think they would in the case of a pound of flesh. But for excessive usurious interest, we've done it. So people have been charged usurious interest, amounts that was thought to be immoral uh, by the Christian churches not too long ago, amounts that uh, were actually forbidden by state law in Indiana and in other states. Okay, remedies. Now we need to talk just briefly about remedies. Our remedies we're going to talk about later in a much greater extent, but the remedies are designed to protect the reasonable expectations of the party. And we'll see that that's an important thing to remember. So I want to mention it at this point so you have that in mind as we go through contracts. That, you know, if you have to go to court, you what you really want is for your reasonable expectations to be fulfilled. And you're, that's all you're entitled to. So that in that sense, uh, as we'll see later when we talk to torts, the damages in, in, in contracts are limited to actual damages. You don't get punitive damages. Contractual remedies are not used as punishment. Uh, that's the usual case. However, in insurance contracts, where an insurance company doesn't pay off, uh, oftentimes they might be charged with bad faith and therefore uh, be ordered to pay uh, punitive damages. But except for Bad faith cases of insurance where companies um, are, uh, you know, taking advantage of the insured. Uh, the the insured might be required to pay off, even though uh, his terms would have indicated otherwise. So you see that in certain legal cases. I think John, uh, Mr. Graham wrote a novel all about that. About and Matt Damon uh, was the attorney involved in that case. And, uh, you know, basically it was a boy who was very, very sick with leukemia, and the insurance company refused to pay and say it was a, uh, you know, a, a, a new and novel uh, medicine prohibited by the contract. The contract said that, you know, these new kinds of, of, of uh, remedies, in this case the remedy for the leukemia that he had, was not covered under contract because it was not considered to be a standard practice by them, but apparently other courts considered it otherwise, and so they won in that case. But the problem was the insurance company had never paid anybody, and it was all a scam. And the the owner of the insurance company was taking all the money, and since he didn't have any money to pay out, he hopped on a plane or attempted to get on a plane and go to Europe. He was, however, caught and sent to prison. But the party and who had the insurance, I think basically weren't able to collect the money that they had been ordered. They may have collected some money, but not nearly as much as they should have. So uh, we see that. So, uh, you know, you're not usually going to get punitive damages. So that was basically an insurance case. So uh, insurance companies have to be very careful to pay off when they should and not to be unreasonable. And uh, you know, uh, oftentimes when, when I've had I've had students complain to me about insurance companies, and I said, well, mention to them the fact that uh, you think they're in bad faith, and you're going to consult an attorney and see what happens. They may they just may say, oh, okay, let's look at this again, and they may give you the money, but you might still want to go and check with an attorney to make sure they're giving you enough money <laughs> okay, for all your trouble. And so, um, you know, on the other hand, if you uh, you know, some lawyers would advise you to go first to the lawyer because you will be confronted with some person from the insurance company who will try to get you to settle for a lot less maybe than what you deserve. And since you really don't know what you deserve, you're probably 
going to be taken advantage of again. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, that's it for today. Thank you.